My name is Rebecca Fox, and I'm a student project manager at the Clark Forum for Contemporary Issues at Dickinson College. When we held Clark Forum events in person and on campus, we took a moment to acknowledge that the land on which we gathered belonged to indigenous peoples for centuries prior, prior to European settlement. Currently, I am inhabiting the ancestral land of the Lenape, the Susquehannock, the Conestoga, the Haudenosaunee, the Shawnee, the Erie, and later the Indian children of the Carlisle Indian Industrial School. I encourage everyone watching this evening's program to take a moment after our presentation to acknowledge the tribes whose traditional land you currently inhabit. Tonight's presentation is Life in the ACE, Arts, Community, and Economics by Joanna Castro, class of 1998. This event is sponsored by the Clark Forum for Contemporary Issues and co-sponsored by, by the Department of Spanish and Portuguese. This program is also a part of the Clark Forum's The Good Life series, a collection of events which encourages viewers to reconsider aspects of their own lives, whether that be daily on a small scale or looking, long, looking at long-term practices to adopt as we age. In the times before COVID, I, like many others, took walks for granted. Wandering up and down the main street in my town was the last resort of the bored high school students waiting to be picked up by their parents. During the shutdown though, leaving my house at any point became an exciting reprieve. Taking my dogs on walks through the woods was nice, but walking past stores and shops in town with art in their windows and praise for essential workers in chalk on the ground made me far more hopeful for the future and more desperate to get back to a time without COVID. Art and communities continuing to cause these aspirations and emotions is an important social practice that needs to be upheld and funded which is why I'm so grateful for Joanna Castro, who's speaking with us today. Castro has been focusing on public art through, communi through community advocacy and economic development. Organizations such as the Northern Manhattan Arts Alliance, or NOMA for short, help to ensure that public art keeps being created and more importantly, funded. NOMA does this by cultivating, supporting, and promoting local artists and art organizations. By taking away social interactions, COVID has emphasized the need for communities, and we can begin to see the importance of art in community revitalization, especially in a post-pandemic world. Joanna Castro is currently the Director of Programs at the West Harlem Development Corporation. She earned her BA in Spanish and International Studies cum laude from Dickinson in 1998 before receiving her MA in Arts and Cultural Management from the Universidad Carlos in Madrid. Castro has over 10 years of nonprofit executive experience working and consulting with Northern Manhattan community stakeholders and has expanded outreach and funding to New York art organizations as well as local businesses by forging alliances, grant opportunities, and cultivating public engagement around issues in affecting the Northern Manhattan community. Castro has received fellowships from the Coro Neighborhood Leadership and the Hispanic Federation, among others. She is an advisor for the Emerging Leaders Program at the New York Foundation for the Arts. There will be a question and answer session following this presentation, so please type any questions into the live chat feature next to this YouTube video at any time. Please pose questions only in the live chat feature as this is not the space for exchanging personal opinions during the speaker's presentation. Now, I'm so pleased to present Joanna Castro. Thank you. Thank you, Rebecca. Good evening, everyone. Uh, first of all, I'd like to thank Professor Mark Aldrich for inviting me to um, speak here tonight, um, as well as to Sarah, Rebecca, and Kim for making sure that things run smoothly. And thank you for the wonderful introduction. I couldn't help but notice uh, a canvas um, in uh, your background, Rebecca, so I take it that you're an artist, so I'm very happy about that. Um, so yeah, so um, I'd like to share with you how my personal and professional trajectory led me on a journey to community advocacy, connecting arts, community, and economic development. Um, and I hope that by the end of this presentation, um, you will take away the importance of the arts in community revitalization in the post-pandemic world. Um, so why these three words, why the ACE? Um, these words have followed me around in my personal and professional trajectory, and they have evolved in terms of its definition and, and its nuance over the years. 
So arts, arts was always my favorite class in school. I took everything under the sun, drawing, painting, ceramics, photography. Um, yet my parents led very traditional careers. My mother was an ESL, English as a second language, retired teacher. And my dad was a computer engineer. So there was no one in my immediate family that was an artist um, or who led a creative um, career. Um, I did have, and I have a beloved aunt, Aunt Isabel, um, who is a retired pharmacist and was a landscape painter uh, by night or on the weekends. Um, so I knew early on that the arts would not be part of my professional calling. And I knew right when I stepped on campus um, in Carlisle that I wanted to double major in international studies in Spanish. So um, I decided, okay, let me take uh, an art studio class freshman year. And then senior year, I took, I audited an Italian Renaissance class. In terms of community, so the C and the ACE, um, I want to make reference to one of the words that I heard as soon as I stepped onto our beautiful campus on, uh, in Carlisle, um, regards to the student professor ratio uh, in the different communities that became part of my day to day, including for my majors the different clubs I was involved with um, and how these clubs um, and communities evolved and expanded over the years. Um, here I can't help but put my IS hat for a brief moment and be reminded of the French diplomat Alexis de Tocqueville and whose analysis of the young nation um, and make, making reference to our penchant for com committees, which I think now we could perhaps translate to communities. And the last part of the acronym for ACE e economics. Uh, I must admit, economics was never my favorite class. So if Professor Fratantuono, who was one of my IS professors, if he's hearing this, I hope he covers his ears for a brief moment. Um, I did look at economics more from like a, a personal point of view, uh, growing up in a bilingual and bicultural home, understanding that inflation was not a good word, that it would hamper family visits to another country. And that was pretty much it. Um, and really it wasn't until senior year that I had one of uh, my aha moments when I became a member of the finance committee. Uh, for those of you who might not know, the finance committee is, is an arm of the student senate and its mission is to um, fund uh, clubs, uh, organizations on campus. So here I realized the importance of not only being involved in, in clubs or entities that I liked, that I liked its mission, um, yet I found also important uh, to be in the room where it happens, uh, as a famous musical once said, and I'll make reference to, to Hamilton a little bit later on in my presentation. So I'd like to share my screen with you. So uh, my presentation is going to be um, divided into different chapters. So um, here's chapter one. Bear with me one moment as I... Uh, There we go. So I think you should be able to see chapter one, um, as I like to call it, my Malaga. Um, so this is this is Malaga. Um, Malaga was um, where I spent my junior year abroad. And now I'm going to talk about the arts, the A. It was it was a year first for me, the, my first trip to Europe, uh, my first arts internship at the Picasso Foundation. Um, so here's the image. So uh, right behind Picasso on the corner here is the Picasso Foundation, which is where he was born. And perhaps more importantly, it was the first time I saw arts managers in action. This experience was pivotal as it planted a seed um, for me in a career in the arts, something that I had not believed possible until then. The C for community, community going back to Dickinson, 
Um, in this case, we were one of the smallest cohorts of the Malaga Study Abroad program. So we were a dozen and we really became a Brady Bunch. So our community was very tight um, and perhaps because it was so small. So we, we've become lifelong friends and we actually have plans for virtual viritos as uh, one of us likes to call our gatherings um, in, a, in a few days. Economics. Here I began to understand what cultural tourism meant. Malaga, as some of you might know, is a medium-sized city in the sunny coast or Costa del Sol, where the weather is absolutely wonderful pretty much year-round. And um, it did not have, when I was there, the cultural gems the way that other cities in the south did, including Seville and Granada. So by the end of spring semester, I did a research paper on what would become the Picasso Museum. This was open, the museum opened in 2013, so many years later, thanks to a pivotal donation by Christine and Bernard Ruiz Picasso. The local government back then knew of the importance of culture as a way to galvanize uh, the city into a major tourist destination. So years later, when I went back to Malaga and lived there, one of the first changes that I encountered was that Calle Larios, which is the Fifth Avenue of Malaga, became pedestrian. And with that, over the years, other cultural institutions became part of the city, including the Pompidou and the Russian Museum, as well as the Thyssen. And one of the last changes I saw uh, was uh, in Malaga a few years ago was the port as major cruises would make Malaga a destination. So all this to say that Malaga looked very different from when I was there in the 90s up until now. Now I'm gonna go to chapter two. Finding my tribe in Madrid. So after working and living in my beloved Malaga, I decided it was time to take the, the big leap and move to the big city, move to Madrid. I was incredibly scared and nervous, yet I knew it was an accelerating move for me. Here, arts was everywhere. It was basically out, arts education outside the classroom. Uh, there was always something to see and do. The image you see here is of the Matadero, which is basically the meatpacking district version um, of uh, in Madrid. And um, it was a meatpacking district way back in the day, and now it's a cultural center with a cinema, exhibit space, and other cultural programming. Community, here making reference to the title of chapter two, I found my tribe. So almost 10 years after graduating from Dickinson, I decided to get my master's in arts and cultural management. And uh, we had a small cohort. So again, community, we were about 30 um, colleagues, uh, classmates, and we were from throughout Spain as well as different parts of the world. Uh, full disclosure here, I never studied art history. So for me, learning was going to a museum, going to a concert, having conversations with my fellow classmates. As I mentioned before, I knew I would not become an artist. I knew I wasn't good enough. Yet my next best option was having a career being surrounded by artists. I also learned to appreciate the differences everyone brought to the table of how they viewed culture and the arts. I was gently reminded that the US, even though it was a superpower, did not have a department of culture the way that Spain and other countries did have a ministry. I was also reminded that here we have, here in the US, we have a National Endowment for the Humanities um, and that they're not on the same level as, as a department or as a ministry. And that the conversation about tangible and intangible arts and culture are normally not part of the conversation the way that they are in other parts of the world. In terms of economics, 
through my master's, I did a capstone analysis with a smaller cohort. And we analyzed Casa de America, also known as House or Home of the Americas. This cultural institution is located in the heart of Madrid and its creation coincided with the 500th discovery, some would say, others would say the encounter of the Europeans uh, of America by the Europeans, as well as the 1992 Olympics in Barcelona. The mission of this cultural entity was to strengthen the, the relationship or the bridge between Spain and the Americas. So it offers cultural programming, including exhibits, theater, cinema, literature. In other words, cultural diplomacy mixed in with cultural tourism. Now I'm gonna jump And here was a leap across the pond. Turn to one of my homes, in this case, New York. I was born in, in New York. So what was supposed to be a six month stint doing an internship at Instituto Cervantes turned out to be a five year career change. Uh, five years working at Instituto Cervantes. So what is ICNY? It's basically cultural diplomacy on a global scale. The organization gets half of its funding from the, from the Spanish Ministry of Foreign Affairs. And its mission is to promote Spanish language and culture. There are about 80 centers throughout the world. New York has the largest center in the US and it functions, as I like to say, in the shape of a triangle, offering Spanish language classes. That's where half, the other half of the income comes. A library, which functions as, an, as a public library and cultural programming. The, ent the, the department that spends all the money. Here, the image you see is of Spanish actor, Antonio Banderas, who came uh, to Instituto Cervantes and um, here are my, my then colleagues um, enjoying a, a five, minute, five minute fun moment. We had many fun moments. Um, as the number of VIPs that would pass through Instituto Cervantes uh, was pretty regular. In terms of community, it felt like a little Spain. It felt like I was still there even though I was across the pond. I also want to share that um, the Dickinson Malaga program uh, took place at Instituto Cervantes um, a few years ago. In terms of economics, here we were hit by the global recession. This was 2007, eight. How did something on a global scale affect us on a hyper-local scale? Um, simply said, number of folks uh, who, have, who normally would register for language classes um, stopped coming. And so what we had lived through 2007, the vacas gordas or the fat cows became the vacas flacas, the skinny cows. Expenses had to be streamlined as well as funding from our headquarters in Madrid was also cut. So this meant that lavish receptions were not taking place, that guest speakers from different parts of the Spanish speaking world were not coming in the same way the printing of catalogs was also streamlined. So the global recession made us think that we could not continue the European model of culture is a right and the government will basically fund it. Elements of the quote unquote American model came into play, meaning using certain parts of a historic building where the Instituto Cervantes is headquartered here in New York for rentals, uh, more sponsorships, more collaborations that shared expenses for cultural programming. So moving from my beloved Brooklyn, I took the A train uptown. 
or as some of us call it upstate Manhattan. As uh, some of you might know, taking the A turn is a famous Duke Ellington song. So I moved to upstate Manhattan, also known as Inwood, when I became program director at NOMA, the Northern Manhattan Arts Alliance, which is an art service organization that promotes, cultivates, and supports the works of artists and arts organizations in Northern Manhattan. So going back to ACE, or the A, arts was part of my day-to-day. -day. Uh, this was a very sweet time in my life, being surrounded by artists, their influences, their creative process. Part of this rubbed off on me, encouraging me to be creative, something that I thought that only artists could do. This allowed me to think outside the box, not only in programming, uh, but also just troubleshooting everyday situations that would come up in the office. In terms of my IS major, I also connected with US diplomacy and the ripple effect it would have on immigration, particularly uptown. Uptown is made up of a plethora of different communities and the majority is Dominican. I was also reminded of freshman year or freshman seminar reading in the time of the butterflies in Professor Alberto Rodriguez's class. The C for community, it was one of the first times that I felt that I was part of a community. I lived and worked in the community. I walked to the office on a nice day and I just got to meet a lot of really cool people. One of my favorite times of the year is June, not only because it's my birthday month, but also because of the Uptown Arts Draw, a month long festival that started off as a pop-up, extended to a, month, a week, two weeks, and eventually a month. By the year 2019, about 300 events took place in a month. This is crazy, insane, and just wonderful. Also note, I was the only full-time staff at NOMA. I was happy to have my wingman and wingwoman, um, my two colleagues, along with a group of consultants. The image that you're seeing here is from the 2019 stroll. This was the opening with many of the honorees as well as uh, members of our board and my work colleagues. This is at, at the United Palace, a beautiful theater uh, uptown. And you will perhaps recognize one or perhaps a couple of more people, uh, including Uptown's own Lee Manuel Miranda. Lynn was receiving the poster for the 2019 stroll on behalf of In the Heights, the movie that had been filmed that spring and was scheduled to premiere last year. Unfortunately, due to COVID, um, it will premiere this year, so June of 2021, both in the theaters as well as on HBO. Here, economics took a different slant. Um, it became hyperlocal again from beginning to end. Here, economics, because arts really is, I, I was able to see firsthand that arts was the economic engine of the community. When we talked, when someone would ask me, what do you do? Depending on who it was, I would say I promote artists. Yet, if I needed to be a bit more wonkish, I would say economic development through the arts. At the same time, I was acutely aware of gentrification and how it really felt like a tsunami of changes that we could do nothing about. Here, I'd like to invite you to have perhaps a shift and think of not that artists push uh, or promote gentrification, that it's really more the market forces. The last chapter, chapter five, 
my next leap. This is an image of the West Harlem Viaduct. So I recently became director of programs at the West Harlem Development Corporation in January. So I'm still a newbie. Um, I am not here to represent West Harlem yet. I wanted to share with you what our mandate is. Community. So what exactly do we do? We're one of, of the first community trusts in the nation. And we were, we were originated by, uh, out of eminent domain, uh, made by Columbia University uh, on Manhattanville, which is just north of 125th. An agreement was made between Community Board 9 and Columbia in what is known as the Community Benefits Agreement. In terms of economics, just to give you a sense, um, over the course of 16 years, the West Harlem Development Corporation will be given $76 million along with other pools of money to redirect towards the community. Last year alone, we gave 1 million in grants, including an additional 500,000 uh, in what was called the COVID-19 impact grant. So my duties are the re-grant program, uh, the ARISE, which is a summer youth development program, as well as other initiatives. So as I begin to wrap up, Here that give you a little bit of, of what's been going on and how potentially we can address it. So we know that Uptown, we know New York as well as Uptown was So as we begin to look at COVID recovery, that means not only vaccination, but also how we deal with challenges stemming from gentrification, something that I had mentioned earlier. We know that food and housing insecurity is something that um, has been exacerbated by COVID. On a deeper level, how do we address what many call the triple pandemic, reckoning on race and racism, COVID-19 and climate change. Here again, I put my IS hat and I'm reminded of two other experiences that New York felt deeply. One was 9-11 and the other one was the AIDS crisis two very heart-wrenching episodes in our recent history with loss of life and an initial lack of understanding and misunderstanding. For none of these three cases, meaning 9-11, the AIDS crisis, and now COVID, did not, none of these had a rubric. In other words, the plane was being flown while it was being built. Yet I'm hopeful. I believe that artists are poised to create change and that's what we need today. I'm hopeful. I invite change makers to include arts in their toolbox, to change perception to build relationships and to foster action. Change is needed and it's possible. I'd like to share with you two examples of grants that were extremely exciting. One was through the New York Community Trust Relief and Resilience. The New York Community Trust is one of the oldest private foundations in the country. It partnered with many others, including the Ford Foundation, and gave out in a short amount of time last year, 
$110 million to 800 organizations, which is absolutely amazing. On a hyper-local level, another entity, LISC, Local Initiatives Support Corporation, gave a grant to R2 Community Bookshops, Sister Uptown, and Word Up Community Bookshop, Libreria Comunitaria. I want to give you an example, particularly of this grant, which is part of a bigger grant, to show you the connection of the arts with community and economics. So the idea was to have to showcase a book during um, every Saturday. The way that they did it, and this was done virtually, was by showcasing an, a local author, showcasing a local artist and raffling his or her work, and showcasing a local business and encouraging folks to buy local. There are many wonderful examples of what's being done. I invite you to look, take a second look. Thank you so much. I hope you enjoyed this presentation. And I leave you with a quote by poet Langston Hughes. Perhaps the mission of an artist is to interpret beauty to people, the beauty within ourselves. Thank you very much. Thank you, Joanna, for that presentation. Uh, we can now begin the question and answer session of the evening. Our first question um, is about mentorship. Who did you consider a leader or a mentor when you were younger, first getting into the process of the job world? What traits, if any, have you adopted into your own practices as somebody who now fills that role of mentor in your position now? That's a great question. So there are actually two components to it. Um, GCS, it may be my mom was one of my mentors. Um, her commitment to teaching ESL very early on before it was cool, before it was trendy. Her philosophy of doing good, being good, just was deeply engraved in me. Um, I also want to kind of turn the question around a little bit and say when I moved back to New York, I had no natural network. I had lived abroad for seven years and I was in looking everywhere where I could and I wanted this person, this guru to tell me what to do. And lo and behold, over the course of several years, I realized that there would be no one person who could be a mentor. That really mentors are a cohort or is a cohort of different people you meet along the way. Yeah, for me, it's been very important to make sure that I meet with emerging professionals. And so that's one of the ways that I do through NIFA of having conversations. So it doesn't have to be a one year program. It can be a one hour conversation with someone and just sharing your experience. Um, in terms of mentorship, I think it's also peer mentorship. Um, I encourage uh, folks to, to do fellowships. Uh, one of my dear friends um, would laugh every time I said, ooh, ooh, can you, can you look something over? And she said, oh my God, is it that time of month? Are you applying to another fellowship? So over the course of, of several years, um, I did at least one fellowship a year. Um, so maybe I got a little bit addicted to it. Yet I learned just as much from my peers as I did from um, professionals in the arts world. Fantastic, thank you. Our next question is asking, uh, do you have any opinion on the future of the Hispanic society an often overlooked institution of Northern Manhattan? Um, the new director says they must engage the local community, but their history in that regard is not strong. I wish the new executive director all the best. Uh, I think it's an exciting time, not only because 
um, of having a new name, a new face lead the organization. Um, yet also the capital campaign and all the changes that are being done to the building to make it more accessible. And the new programming that they have in place now, uh, continuing to connect and continuing to reflect the community. Great. Um, during your presentation, you spoke briefly about the last, the 2008 economic recession. How do you think that the recent uh, troubles with COVID and sort of the economic recovery time, how do you think that that will impact the art community? I think artists are incredibly re resilient and I believe that they will um, put their best foot forward. It's just gonna take some time. Um, we're seeing here in our community, one of the highest rates of COVID. Um, the vaccination process has been incredibly slow. Um, so there, there have been um, several hurdles um, that have made the recovery challenging, yet not impossible. Um, so I think we have to make it a team effort. We know we can't rely only on the local, state, or federal funding that we have in the past because we, we can assume to a certain extent that it will be cut or it won't be as much as it has been in the past. Uh, I'm hopeful that philanthropy will continue to step in and continue to offer support. Um, and also the importance of advocacy. I think that we need to be vocal with our elected officials and, and make clear that the arts is key for community revitalization. So is education and health, yet they're all connected. That leads perfectly into the next question from an audience member. Uh, this event is part of the Good Life series. How important is your work to your understanding of what it means to have the good life? Well, one of the things that I learned in Spain was enjoy life. Um, life is too short. Uh, COVID has um, provoked uh, incredible havoc. Um, last year on a personal level, it was an extremely difficult year. Um, so how to balance um, the craziness that sometimes falls in our lap with the seriousness of our mission of things that make us happy and um, make us do good things. I'm, I'm a strong believer that we have to have a mission in life um, and I might sound a little preachy, I hope that, that that's not my intent, yet um, life is so many things. They're just, they're, there's so many shades of what we can do as individuals and as communities. Um, how can we have enriching lives and not in a, necessarily in a financial way, yet how can we have a life that reflects the best of us, the goodness that, that we all have? Great response. Uh, our next question is, do you see any significant differences in the funding or appreciation of the arts between your experience in Europe, Malaga and Madrid and the US, New York? Yeah, so I alluded to it um, a little bit when I was talking about my time in Madrid of um, the European model, and this is general terms, um, is very much the government will provide versus the American model, which is very entrepreneurial. Um, and I think at the end of the day, the ideal is probably a combination of A and B. Um, the fact that we don't have a Department of Culture, I think is, is incredibly sad. How can we be a superpower and not have the arts elevated the same way that education is. 
um, in the way that other um, departments are. Um, other superpowers um, have a ministry or have a department. So I don't think we're gonna have a department anytime soon, yet I think the, um, there's been a shift um, in terms of day-to-day, -day, uh, what how we view the arts and how arts for art's sake, maybe it's one way of, of seeing art, yet I think there's been a greater appreciation of what artists do, which is to empower community, to reflect community, and to galvanize change. On the topic of community, can you speak a little bit more to how your experience as a Dickinson student has affected you later on in life, whether that be the uh, liberal arts values in education or the community aspect at, on of Dickinson's campus? So I went uh, to a public school. I grew up just outside of Washington, DC. And it was a mini UN. I had folks from my colleagues, my classmates were from throughout the world. And when I came into to, to Carlisle, to, to our campus, uh, I was just amazed at how beautiful it was. And I was just blown away. Yet I felt very much out of place. Um, when I studied there, uh, BIPOC uh, folks, uh, people of color, um, for lack of a better word, we were very much a minority. And it, it took a while to get used to, and it took a while to figure out where I wanted to be and how to navigate the water. So I think that was one of my life lessons. Um, when people ask me, where am I from? I'm like, I'm American. Uh, I don't answer that necessarily yet. My kind of way around it is, do you want the short answer, the long answer, or the in-between answer? Um, the short answer is that my mother was Irish American and my dad was from Venezuela. I grew up in Venezuela. I lived in Spain for seven years and now I live here. So that was one uh, kind of very personal aspect. The other is I like to learn and Dickinson was just a great place to just soak everything I could. Um, I look back and I'm part of me thinks, well, wow, how, how interesting that I double majored in Spanish and international studies, which are, at the end of the day are two majors that have a little bit of, of different aspects. And I think that served me well. Um, part is um, being a diplomat. So studying diplomacy, studying politics and history comes in handy. Um, when I lived in Spain, and when I moved to uptown, understanding foreign policy and understanding who Trujillo was, um, who was a dictator on uh, the Dominican Republic, understanding the nuances of, um, of politics and how those are reflected also in art and in culture. So I think at the end of the day, my experience at Dickinson just brought in all these elements. My, the fact that um, I lived abroad. So um, even though I spoke Spanish, I grew up speaking Spanish, living in, in Spain and living in Europe and traveling in Europe, just added another level to, to my set of experiences. So I think Dickinson, even though it wasn't necessarily always an easy time, um, it was a great opportunity to just learn and, and push myself and just meet interesting people that I'm still connected with. Um, so uh, soaking, soaking these opportunities and learning that even if things are not always wonderful, there is, there's a ray of sunshine and there's something to, to learn. That's really lovely, thank you. Our next question, um, how do you approach community advocacy? Can you elaborate on your observations of gentrification and what the, what the relationship is between art and resilient communities? So community advocacy is something that took a while for me. Um, 
So when I was at NOMA, my clear mission was, I'm going to promote artists. I'm going to do everything in my power to make sure that they have the skill set to do their craft. And that was through three core programs. We would have group exhibits. We would have uh, what is known as technical assistance. So we would have workshops or a day-long symposium once a year and the stroll. So in terms of advocacy, um, it was just making sure that I got funding, <clears throat> excuse me, so that my programs would have funding, which would then go to artists. So it meant meeting and talking to my elected officials. Um, one of the first times I spoke to our congressman, I was just like, oh my God, who am I to talk to this person who, who goes to Washington and, and speaks to all these VIPs? Uh, and I'm like, okay, I need to just take the plunge and, and just do it. Um, so advocacy can take many shapes and sizes. And it's just basically promoting what you believe, whether it's making phone calls, I'm making sure people get out and vote, contacted our elected officials, uh, just saying what you believe and, and, and pushing the envelope. So that of course is different from, from lobbying um, and understanding that, that there is a difference, that you can advocate to entities, um, the community board um, is also um, another entity that is part in, here in New York, a place where we can voice our opinions. So one of my first times going to the Arts and Culture Committee, I'm just like, oh my God, what, what am I gonna say? What, what, uh, what, if, what if someone asks me something I can't answer? Um, and just be pleasantly surprised at, at, it, at the end of the day, these are community members who care and who are there because they also want to learn and they also wanna institute change. Um, so living and working in the community and seeing all the folks that really love, love uptown in my case, um, and really care and really are vested and really want, want the best of the community. Um, so in terms of gentrification, it's, it, it's been extremely difficult because we see um, we see the foot lines. We see, I know um, that there are several community organizations that have had to increase um, how often um, they give out food because people are, are not eating, kids are not eating. Um, uh, folks have passed away in a family, there's no income. And so there are serious issues that, that we're dealing with and these are part of what had started before COVID that were probably in large part, in my opinion, um, created by, by gentrification. So what can entities do? What can we as individuals do? Um, where does um, the local government um, need to come in and, and step in? And where does philanthropy need to be more creative in funding? and really look at collaborations, look at innovative collaborations, look at impact um, so that um, issues that we're facing can be addressed. Have you noticed a difference in your positions, um, both as somebody in uh, very executive positions as the executive director and then in other positions that you've held in dealing with issues of gentrification? Um, can you elaborate a bit more on, on your question? Sure, sure, it wasn't entirely clear. I'm more just wondering if uh, the different roles that you have held have made you look at the issues of gentrification in your community in different ways, or if, you've had a continuous perspective on what the best uh, ways in which you can enact change have been. Thank you. Um, I think is when you're in different rooms, um, you see 
um, hopefully different angles of a situation. So to give you an example, um, I spent a good part of 2015 as a volunteer for a program created by the New York Public Library, Bridging Our Stories. I believe that um, it, it's still online. And the idea was to get community volunteers to interview long-standing residents uh, and hear their stories. And at that point, I had only lived in Inwood for a few years. And I had uh, been the director of programs at NOMA. Yet there was still a lot I didn't know. So really it was just, who can I talk to and just learn how the community has changed from being mostly Irish, uh, was, um, folks that came, uh, immigrants who came uh, from Europe after World War II, um, Cubans, Puerto Ricans, Dominicans, now we're seeing a growing Mexican population, West Africans as well. And just seeing, wow, uh, there's something going on. Um, this, as I mentioned in my presentation, um, the gentrification feels like a tsunami folks are starting to slowly move to other parts of the city, um, to the Bronx, to Staten Island, to the tri-state tri area, to New Jersey, Connecticut. What's going on? And, and feeling at that point as a volunteer, uh, pretty powerless. All I was doing was listening to stories. Um, and then uh, when I became executive director of NOMA of one of my very clear um, mandates was if someone asked me for a favor, meaning, do you have an artist who can do a favor? I said, no, if, it's, if there's no fee involved, please don't ask me for a favor. Um, so be being very clear that, again, my mandate was to make sure that artists were given opportunities and they were rightfully compensated because I knew that not only artists, but other, part, other members of the community were being affected by gentrification. And that artists are professionals, have a trade, have experience, have training, and they should not be compensated with a thank you alone. Um, and that note flows perfectly into my next question which is uh, what is your advice for young artists who want to use their art to help their communities or the public in some forum? Uh, my recommendation is uh, reach out, get involved, find out what groups are doing what, um, volunteer uh, time, whether it's phone banking or going to an event or, or helping out. Um, Go to your community board, be informed what's going on, what's the pulse of the community, what, um, what's going on, what, what can you do, what do you feel comfortable doing, whether it's making uh, a donation, big or small, with your time, uh, financially. Um, I, I get concerned, and maybe part of it is that I grew up in Washington and I grew up watching Inside Washington, this is my nerdy side, I grew up watch, watching uh, Inside Washington um, and Meet the Press. I don't think there were too many teenagers, um, even now, who, who watch these shows. I get concerned when friends of mine say, I don't want to watch the news. Uh, I think we need to know what's going on. Um, Watching 24 seven, maybe not, but reading, being aware of what's going on and, and being alert and, and finding a comfortable way, what, whatever those means might be uh, to help and, and to feel part of the community. I know for me personally, uh, in the pandemic specifically, art has been a really important tool to help remind me of what life looked like before and what it'll look like again after. Uh, as somebody who isn't 
necessarily an artist, but who once one who once thought about going down that path. How has art impacted you during the past year plus of living in a pandemic? I missed it terribly. Um, so when the lockdown began in New York, as many of you know, New York was perhaps the worldwide um, center of, of the epidemic and um, the lockdown uh, began. Uh, it was all Zooming, um, phone, email, and that was pretty much it. Um, so in the fall, when museums started opening up, that was one of the first things I did. I went to the Whitney, I wanted to see um, Americana, um, the, uh, basically it's an exhibit, I think it's still up, um, the Mexican influence on, on US artists. I wore an N95 mask, I could barely breathe. I was incredibly paranoid, yet I knew I wanted to see the exhibit. Um, Luckily, it was a rainy day. There were very few people, and, and I got to see, again, Diego Rivera and Frida Kahlo and all these wonderful artists um, that I, I very much like. Um, so now I'm just going to as many cultural events as possible and making up for lost time. I, I miss not talking to artists. I miss not, not seeing art, not seeing live art. Um, in the summer when things were kind of slowly, um, we were kind of, I guess, slowly coming out of COVID, one of our community partners, Broadway House and Communities, um, it's the parent entity, um, and uh, they, they built the Sugar Hill Children's Museum of Art and Storytelling. Um, and um, one of the community uh, liaisons, um, who has since retired, um, created this project of these wood panels created by different artists. And so these wood panels were inside uh, facing the street so that folks could walk by the building and see art. And um, we were just so excited to just see people who we hadn't seen in several months. Um, you know, it was all socially distanced. Um, the reception was kind of hush hush and was promoted last minute. So a lot of people would purposely not come. And it, it was just kind of eerie. Do we hug? Do we wave? Do we namaste? What do we do? And so just on a social level, um, it really, it, it's, I think we're, we're still kind of adjusting. Of what do we do? I, I saw my cousins um, over the holiday weekend and I said to my cousin, are we touching? Um, Cause he was coming right at me to give me a, a kiss on the cheek. And he's like, yeah, yeah, I'm fine. I'm fine. I got vaccinated. Um, and when I'm now through my new job meeting, not that many, but meeting a few people in person, it, it's just kind of, what do I do? Do I want to shake hands? Do I want to, rub elbows um and it, it's just it, it's 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 a weird period we're living i think while the weather is now starting to be nice let's soak as much art as possible in a safe way of course absolutely uh we're coming up on time so we have time for just about one last question um what do you think on the topic of art what do you think the future of the art community will look like in New York? Do you think we'll get back to that vibrant, lovely place? Or do you think there will be a lasting impact of COVID that we'll see for years to come? I think that the impact of COVID will be long lasting. I know, for example, that I spoke to a colleague the other day and he runs a theater in the Bronx and they're not planning to open until at least at some point, maybe 2022. Um, so what is what is short, what is long-term? Um, it's gonna be a while. That, that I think we know for sure, yet we're seeing a lot of creative ways to create and produce art. Um, so here in the city, 
uh, we're seeing open space. I think it's called open spaces, open streets. And it's been pop-ups, which is basically what, what, what it's doing. So pop-up cultural events outdoors. So I think for the summer, we can forecast that. In terms of Broadway, for example, I think that's gonna be a while. I think larger entities um, like the Met um, are gonna take a while. Not only because they, they're just giganta, um, but that they have spaces, they have insurance, they have all these um, other expenses that more nimble organizations um, don't have to worry about. And so the nimble organizations, the community-based organizations are the ones that uh, can and will quickly pivot um, and do, I think, exciting um, new programming that, um, that will be great for, for the community. Well, thank you so much for your presentation and your insights tonight with all of the questions and answers. That concludes this program. Joanna, thank you so much for being here. Thank you, Rebecca. And thank you to all of you.